Jonah chapter 4. People have many motivations for their actions. The Bible teaches us both the simplicity of our beliefs and wants as the dynamics for our emotions and actions. But the Bible also explains how complex the interaction between these can be. And sometimes this makes it difficult to understand why people feel and act the way they do. And that complex motivation is often illustrated in the stories of the Bible. From Eve's first sin to Israel's grumbling and complaining to their dissatisfaction with the rebuilt temple, the Bible is realistic about people. People suffer, people sin, people struggle with deep heart issues that overflow in fruit and eventually in harvest. People are perplexed by God and the world, and they want, oh, they so want to be in control. They want God to do what they want. They struggle mightily with submitting to God's will. Kings and priests and prophets all struggled in the same way. They often had big dreams and large purposes and sometimes more clarity about what God specifically wanted them to do. But then things turned out as they wanted, did not turn out as they wanted or hoped. These crashing dreams led to being downcast or as we would say, depressed. Or they became angry with God and self-justifying. This is a toxic mix in the heart. A good theology misapplied, a belief in one's uniqueness before God, a craving to control, a refusal to accept God's will, a lack of submission to God and His word, a grudging, minimal obedience, a surprising and magnificent work of God, an anger over such mercy of God. This is Jonah. And this is some of you. Our book has brought us to, um, through its story, to this point in our, at the end of the book. We are faced with the fact that God had commissioned and then recommissioned Jonah. He had fled and then he had obeyed. We have Jonah's magnificent, humbled prayer and we have Jonah's angry prayer and God's rebuke. This is the story of the book. And Jonah is a foil for the character of God and the message of the book. And so the people and the king of Nineveh have turned from sin and idolatry to the Lord. This may be the greatest revival in all of history. One man's preaching, possibly for only a day, has been the instrument of that great work of God... What an amazing joy this must have been. Well, not so much. Verse 1, Jonah chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was, I love the old English here, wroth. He was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, take my life. It is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? 
And we have Jonah's displeasure as he sulks over Nineveh's repentance. What an incredible surprise. This is not at all what we would have expected. And yes, he fled from his responsibility, and it took the deliverance of God through the judgment to get him to obey. And this is the prophet who declared, salvation is of the Lord. Now those great words sound hollow and empty. This great repentance has displeased Jonah. The other words here could be irked. Annoyed, upset. In fact, in our modern language, Jonah is having a meltdown, a freak out. Literally, the Hebrew reads, it was an evil thing to Jonah. Our translators are wanting to convey something from the Hebrew. It's the most intensive form you can have. He was exceedingly displeased that the Ninevites had repented. This is not saying it caused Jonah to do evil. No, Jonah simply reviewed their repentance as an evil thing. He was angry. He is angry that all those people avoided the wrath of God. He is angry that sinners are turned from wickedness. He is angry that the people are grieved over their sin. He is angry that the king has repented. He is angry that the king has stepped down off his throne and is sitting in sackcloth and ashes. He is angry, angry, angry. So he blames God for his disobedience. Now, frankly... This prayer took some guts. Well, no, it didn't. When people are thoroughly and deeply and self-righteously angry, they will say and do the most appalling things. Jonah is spitting mad. And he spits out a very disrespectful accusatory speech to God. He says, this is exactly I did why I did not go when you told me to go to Nineveh. This is what I said then. Now, we've often pointed out that when people blame their situation or their circumstances for their sins, they are effectively blaming God. Jonah's not even subtle. He ran. He fled in the opposite direction because he, well, he knew exactly what God was like. Jonah takes good theology and uses it to bad effect. He knew that God was gracious and merciful and slow to anger. Where did he get those words? Well, he got them from Joel 2, verses 12 to 14, which read, Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your gar hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and he relents over disaster who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him a grain offering a drink offering to the lord your god those words were preached to israel well, most of the prophecies of the Old Testament declared God's outpouring of wrath on the nations. They focused on both the near and the last day judgments. But they also spoke of a future hope for Gentiles in the context of God's promise to Abraham. But Jonah has not misunderstood the character of God. He is utterly clear about who God is and what he's like. And he doesn't get those ideas out of thin air. He gets them from the book of Joel. It's not that Jonah did not expect Nineveh to repent. <laughs> he knew this was just exactly what God was like. He fully expected that God would show grace and mercy and be long-suffering and relent of disaster. He just didn't want it. This is stunning. Jonah's anger is against what God is actually like. He believed Nineveh deserved the wrath of God because of their wickedness. He wanted Nineveh punished. He wanted it so badly he was displeased and angry. 
This is so common, even among believers. Despite what God says in his word, you want or don't want something different. When God requires what he commands or when he gives you what you do not want, you become frustrated, disobedient, and yes, downcast or depressed. You eventually become angry with God and will blame shift your own disobedience to God. And unless this, there is genuine repentance, this will not end well. Ketty warns us, quote, if we are tempted to shrug this off as, well, an attitude as a passing phase, as we too often, too easily do with our own children, then we should remember that this was lethal for the Jews of Jesus' day. Rejecting God is, in its very nature, a totally irrational business, Ketty writes. It is the end of all reason and sense. It involves, of necessity, the victory of utter foolishness and self-destructive passions, end quote. And so, he joins the role of suicidal prophets. See, there's a dishonorable role of prophets who have sought to escape their responsibilities through suicide. Consider Moses. Numbers 11, 10 through 15. I won't read all of that, but verse 15. Moses finally says, I am not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight. <laughs> kill me if I find grace that I may not see my wretchedness. Elijah says the same thing, or something very similar in 1 Kings 19. Again, the whole story, it's just right after the, the fire comes down, consumes the altars, the, the priests of Baal are slaughtered, and great victory, next scene. Ahab and Jezebel are hunting him down. He's running for his life, and he's sitting trembling under a juniper tree, and he says, he asks that he may die, saying, it is enough. I have had it now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And Jonah's displeasure and self-pitying depression and blame-shifting now become self-destructive and suicidal. Now, now, this could be dramatic overstatement. That would not be unusual in God's treatment of it. almost seems to dis dismiss it like we would a childish temper tantrum. Before Jonah, it was better to die at God's hands than to live and see God's mercy. Now notice that every one of these prophets asks God to kill them. They will not do it themselves. I started to say they're a bunch of cowards. What does this mean? Why should someone reach a point where they would ask God to take their life? It seems to me that this happens when people are suffering so much that they see no way out. The sad fact is that Moses and Elijah, now Jonah, are not really suffering. Jonah, least of all, could grief. At least Moses has a big job. At least Elijah's got king and a queen hunting him down. What's Jonah got? The world's greatest revival. Elijah feels alone and threatened. Moses feels overwhelmed and unable to continue his task. And Jonah is displeased because he didn't get what he wanted. None of them are truly suffering. Their own heart words and wants and cravings and desires are so amplified that they are absolutely their suffering needs to end right now. We're not so different. You can rebel against God's clear providence for our, your lives. You can amplify your terrible situation and its pain. You can magnify the fear of future trouble and future suffering. You can blame God for the cause of your suffering. And finally, you will seek for an escape. Suicide is a kind of escape, but it is not the only escape. Drinking, divorce, moving, self-destruction is simply the ultimate form of many kinds of escapes. 
in every case, God sustains the person and speaks into the person's life. God, after all, is merciful and gracious and patient and pointedly persistent. And so, he's questioned by God. And God also prosecutes him. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Now, God often responds to sinning and attacking people with careful and calculated patience. God is the master at asking questions that expose the heart and probe the conscience. The sinning and hiding Adam was brought out into the open with a sequence of short, pithy questions. Jesus was adept at adroit questions that exposed the motivation and folly of religious people's attacks. God asked Jonah a simple, penetrating question. Now our translation, unlike many others, catches both the meaning and the nuance. God is not asking, why are you angry? Jonah has made it abundantly clear. He wanted Nineveh punished. He is disgusted that God has shown mercy. Why? It's not a question. And notice what is not said. Most of us would have said, is it right for you to be angry? That's that's kind of the obvious question, isn't it? Well, why not ask that? Because Jonah is absolutely believes he has the right to be angry. He's passed judgment on the Ninevites, and God has overturned his judgment. He most certainly feels that he is right. Asking that question that way would just be a basic counseling mistake. God basically asks, is it good for you to be angry? Is this proper? Is Jonah well? Jonah, is it going to be good for your soul to be angry? It's almost a question about how Jonah is doing personally. Jonah, is this going to end well? Are you going to be okay? Now, to us, the answer is obvious. Of course, he's not doing well. This is not a good thing. It is always wrong to challenge God. It's always unwise to assert your rights in the face of God's power and providence. Is Jonah doing well to openly say, quote, I do not like what you are doing. You are acting exactly as I suspected in God. I don't like it. How do we know that this is defiance, insubordination, rebellion, and not just, oh, childish petulance? Jonah's just stomping his feet. Because of what happens next. We have Jonah's exposure in verses 5 through 11. Forty days have passed. And where do we find Jonah? In the city, ministering to new converts? Got 120,000 of them. Preaching the word? Nope. We see his cynical watch. Verse 5, Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. And he sat under it in the shade till he would see what would become of the city. So where do we find Jonah? Jonah. Is this his answer to God? You do well. Yeah, sure, I'm going to go out 40 days later on the 40th day when you said you would judge. I'm going to build me a little hut and I'm going to sit there and see if you actually whack them. Jonah is boycotting God's gracious and merciful deliverance of Nineveh. He doesn't like it. He didn't like God's decision. So he goes outside the city on the east side of the city. Now, for an Israelite, this destruction that is coming will come from the holy temple, from the direction of God's throne and his holy dwelling. Yes, the destruction will come from the west, from Jerusalem. 
This is not about prevailing winds. This is about an expectation of God's might. Moving, judging power, rolling out from his dwelling place on earth to overthrow Nineveh. The author tells us here that Jonah built a booth. He is outside the city in the blazing sun of the Assyrian, remember, Iraq, landscape. Of course, he's going to provide himself some shade from the elements. But why a booth? See, there are lots of words that could have been used. But during the Feast of Tabernacles, the Israelites were to build booths to stay in during the festival week. They would have been a small shacks made of palm fronds. Jonah has built a small shack to shelter himself. Someone commented, we were talking about this, commented, you know, think one of these bus shelters, you know, sort of on three sides and bench. The author has used the word booth to connect to the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles was a few weeks before the Passover. It was intended to celebrate Israel's deliverance from Egypt. <laughs> Talk about ironic. And the wilderness, while also anticipating the coming of Jesus. Jesus is, is God dwelling in the human body. He dwelt or he tented among us. And we saw the true glory of God, full of grace and truth. Why is he there? Well, he stayed there, Scripture says, until he would see what would happen to, jo to Nineveh. What? He has left the city, gone to a place of safety, and built a shelter. He is here to see what will happen. Now, what do you think is going to happen? Come on. Really? He is here because he fully expects that maybe God will judge the city in spite of their repentance, in spite of his mercy, in spite of his grace, in spite of his patience. After all, it's what he would do. Here's the madness of religious people who do not think biblically. Like Jonah, you know what God says. You may even act on that knowledge. But your own desires and idols and cravings cause a kind of emotions and actions that appear unreasonable and illogical and in its worst case irrational and Jonah is all about self-salvation project he flees from God he's delivered through the judgment of the storm and the great fish he now flees from Nineveh and the judgment that he thinks oh that he actually hopes will fall his booth will shelter him from the present sun and the future wrath he's going to be a spectator well, Israel would have caught the illusions immediately, but they would have wondered about the connections. This scene should cause a wry smile and nervous laughter among them. Frankly, most would have entirely sympathized with Jonah. We also see his childish reactions in verses 6 through 8. God's counsel and correction of Jonah moves from words to deeds, and all through the book, we observed the author's humor and irony, even puns. Don't miss it here. Now the Lord God, what's the word? Appointed. Where have we had that word before? He appointed a great fish. Right? He appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. What does that tell you? Well, his booth isn't working so well. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Dawn came up the next day. God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Now, once again, the sovereign God appoints a plant to grow near and over Jonah's shack. He had appointed a great fish and now appoints a large plant. This is miraculous. The language points to overnight, the plant grew up. It was huge. It covered Jonah's shack and provided a deep and comforting shade. 
Look at the language. This was provided to save Jonah. Don't you love it? Say, save from what? The plant was to save Jonah from his discomfort. Oh, seriously, tongue in cheek. This is magnificently ironic. The great fish was appointed to save Jonah from the storm of God's wrath. It took him into the depths and a grave-like death and resurrection. But now God appoints a plant to come up and save Jonah from his discomfort. Now I dismiss out of hand the people who say that this shows the amazing love and care of God for even a foolish and sinning person like Jonah. To do that is to read your own agenda into the text and not read the very evident irony of the text. Jonah was exceedingly, there's that word again, glad for the comfort the plants provided him. He reveled in the good and mercy of God for him. Sitting out on the hillside hoping for the destruction of repentant Gentiles, he sits in the shade of God's goodness and grace. You see it? Israel was reveling in the comforts of God's mercy while relishing the wrath of God to the Gentiles. This is part of the message of the book. It's a message to us. It's extreme, extraordinarily easy to be comforted by what God has given us while totally rejecting what God has given to others. But on the morning light, the plant is withered away and dead. God appointed a worm to eat away the plant so that it wasted away. Here's another of God's commands, God's appointments. Jonah wakes to find his comfort removed. And furthermore, God appointed a sirocco, a scorching east wind. Come on, look at the irony. And a scorching wind to buffet and to burn down on Jonah's head. This is not just discomfort. Now he's fainting. He is withering. And instead of appealing to God for help, instead of crying out to God from the midst of his misery, he whines that it is better to die than to live. See, I was right. He, like Elijah, continues his victimization. He continues to complain. Verse 9, you see his callous heart. He is angry at God for the destruction of the plant. How do we know that? Because what God says. But God said to Jonah, do you well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry. I'm angry enough to die. God challenges Jonah again. Was it good for his soul to be angry over God's mercy to Nineveh? Was it good for his soul to be angry over God's an appointment of a worm to destroy the plant? God, once again, is not asserting his sovereign right to appoint whatever he chooses to do. It's not the point here. Nor is it an open question. The sim- author simply says that God appointed judgment for Nineveh. God appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. God appointed a shade plant for Jonah. God appointed a worm to destroy the plant the next day. That God appoints all these things. That God appoints everything that happens in your life is not an open question. To deny that is to deny the Bible. And I know there are many Christians and many theologians who do not do who deny that. They are, and I say this emphatically and categorically, wrong. What then is God saying? Well, let's invert the question and ask it this way. Is it destructive for Jonah to be angry over the plans and purposes and providences of God? And the answer is, yes. You see right in the text how destructive it is. Jonah's rejection of and lack of submission to what God is doing has led him to become agitated, depressed, and suicidal. The point of all this is to aim the question at Israel. And their answer was just like Jonah. Yes, it is right and good for me to be angry that I have lost the comfort that you have provided me. 
A hundred to a hundred and twenty years later, Israel went in to Neo-Assyrian and Babylonian captivities. The very mercy of God to Assyria at this moment preserved her. They eventually conquered the then northern tribes and carried them away into the captivity of Samaria and Assyria. Question is aimed at each one of us. You, all of you, each of you are living through the appointments of God. You are living under his providences. You may make your plans, but God has laid out the paths and the steps. Some of you are struggling with your current situation, and some of them are hard. Make no mistake. And some of them have brought great changes. Some of them are mercies and grace of God to others. Some of them are the withdrawal of your own comforts and ease. And how are you going to respond? Will you whine and complain and play the victim and become depressed and angry and escapist? Will you assert your own rights? Will you refuse the very evident providence of God? Do you do well to not want what God has given you? And where will such rebellion lead? To God's challenging questions. God's challenge turns Jonah's talk on its head. And the Lord said, you pity the plant? For which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right from their left, and also much cattle? You had pity on a great big vine. How much more should God have pity on such a great city of 120,000 people, including their children, and even all their cattle? God is being ironic and even sarcastic. You pitied the plant. Well, no, did he? No, not really. He pitied himself. Jonah's self pity blinded him to the withering destruction of the plant. God's own words are a withering rebuke of Jonah. You had nothing to do with the planting and cultivating and success of the plant. You did not labor for it. You can take no credit for it. You were sound asleep when it sprung up and when it flourished. And it was the great surprise of the dawn and you were sound asleep when it was destroyed. Yet because it provided for your own comfort, you pitied the poor plant shriveled and withered. Beside your booth. That should be enough on its own, but all this is an object lesson for Jonah and for Israel and for us. We revel the rise and pity the loss of small comforts. How much more should we align ourselves with the greatness of God's mercy and grace and long suffering patience? We pity plant like things. God pities people and even animals who suffer because of people's repentance. Stop. Let this sink in. Jonah pitied a plant. God pitied a great wicked people and all their livestock. What is wrong with Jonah? What is wrong with us? That focuses the question on us. What piercing question focuses on God? God's mercy is greater than than Jonah's anger and Jonah's petulance. What do we do with such an abrupt ending? Where's the rest of the book? This dramatic question ends in silence. A long, drawn-out moment of introspection and conviction And so does the Old Testament. As the Old Testament closes, it closes into 400 years of abrupt, stunning, astonishing, surprising silence. And it is thunderous. The silence is portentous. The silence is interrupted by the word of God. The Son of God entering and 
to the world. And where does that take us? Oh, there are many places in the New Testament seem to draw from this story, but there's a scene in the Gospel of Matthew that is compelling in its contrast. Speaking to religious leaders, Jesus laments, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under your wings, and you were not willing. Your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. O Nineveh, O Nineveh, how grand your repentance. O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, how sad your rebellion. Here is the merciful heart of God over a people who refused and rejected him. Have you? How terrible it is to hate so much that God's mercy irritates and displeases and even angers us. And this doesn't have to be over lost people, it may be over simply repentant. And the key is at the center of the book. Salvation belongs to the Lord who appoints a fish, who appoints a plant, who appoints a worm, who appoints a storm. Will you submit with joy to the providence of God? Will you reach out with mercy and grace to the neighborhoods? and to the nations. And that's how the book closes. Let's pray. Break our hearts, O oh God, that we would be like Jonah and like Israel and unlike Jesus. That we would relish and revel in your mercy. Not just to us. And not only our salvation but our comforts. But in your mighty mercy. To our neighbor. To our neighborhoods. And all to all the nations. Grant that you would transform our hearts through your word and spirit this morning. In Jesus' name.